Welcome back. This is Neil Daly. I'm with McGraw Commercial Properties. This is the office update. On my upper left, we have Hannah DeMuth. Um, below her, Lisa Brandis. And then rounding out the Hollywood Squares, we have Mr. Drew Dossie. And this is the office update. Uh, we have done one of these before, and due to some you know, technical difficulties, weren't necessarily pleased with some of the volumes, decided to re-record it, and we live in a, in a different world now. So we were in the middle of a COVID pandemic, and now that we're in I don't know, the end of the COVID pandemic, but there is larger news on, on all the news outlets right now. So we'll try to blend all of this together. So picking up where we left off, we want to talk about office space from a national perspective. So what is the office environment like around the country right now from a high level perspective? Well, I think that we're seeing a lot of flexibility in the office space right now where, where employers are, are allowing people to come in on flex schedules and, and phasing people in gradually. So I, I think it's going to be that way for a little while till we get through this COVID and, and maybe more in the future too, uh, just making changes to the overall environment. But we're staying pretty busy in Tulsa. It's not you know as, as active as it has been, but we right. have a couple of closings on office space. So from a brokerage standpoint, still a lot of activity. Uh, from the actual occupancy and the day-to-day -day operations, is everybody back in to the office buildings or is it case by case or what are you seeing? I think that people are gradually getting back, but it's, it's still, People, a lot of people working from home from what I'm seeing or talking with people that are looking for space. Right. Uh, what are some of the challenges that landlords are seeing out there right now? I mean, the obvious being, are they collecting rent? You know, that's you as a landlord, that's an investment property. And that's the, that's, if you're a landlord watching this, that's what I want to be updated on. I want to know who's paying rent, who's not paying rent. Um, what are my options if they aren't? What are my options if, uh, if everybody is? If I want to buy another property, what are some scenarios that you're seeing? A lot of landlords typically do not ask for personal guarantees or depending on financials, sometimes don't ask for that. Someone to guarantee the lease to where any new lease that we have started since mid-March when COVID began, definitely a personal guarantee, significantly stronger financials that landlords are looking for right. for a tenant. Um, Give me an example of that. What are you talking about for a significantly better or more information on financials? What's Great question. So we helped bring a, we were helping with a sublease and I was representing the subtenant going into this space. And it was a new company, new to the city. And the landlord definitely was asking for a personal guarantee, business financials from what the business had been doing for the past about three years. Yep. And I had typically not seen that. Usually they'll just ask for a person's signature, but the landlord, this specific landlord is wanting very detailed information, not only on the business, but the business owner and people, the employees. I think that's a case by case, depending on the size of the deal or if the landlord's required to put much money into the transaction in the form of either tenant improvements or free rent, or in, in our case, commissions, if they're paying something out of pocket, they gotta know that there's a good risk attached to that. So I think that is spreading across the board. So if you're a tenant out there right now, make sure you have your paperwork together because that is almost certainly gonna be an ask in regards to signing a, a long-term lease, long-term being at least three years, probably more like five, some cases seven to 10. Make sure you have those financials together. What's an alternative for financials is probably an accountant's audited statement uh, or a bank statement that, uh, our statement from a banker, that would also suffice. Is there anything else that you're thinking of that, that, that could work in addition to that, tax returns? I would say a tax return, a, a great thing about real estate is everything is negotiable and every deal is different. And so there's not one stick that we, you know, a rule of these three things of what we need. I know when we are doing tenant rep. I really try to educate the tenants. Hey, these are the few things that a landlord might request and they are very sensitive documents, but trying to prepare your tenant so when that ask does happen, they already know. Um, it really puts them in a better place to negotiate when, if there are other companies looking to lease the same listing. Yeah, and if there's reluctance to provide a lot of that data, that's a red flag in this environment. I would say in helping to ease that fear as the broker, I've often stepped out of the way and say, listen, I don't need to see them necessarily. I'm not the decision maker. 
you can send them directly to so-and-so or you can put them in Dropbox and send a link. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, uh, confidentiality agreements are very much in play at the moment. Um, if I wanted to send those over here, quick, you know, sign this NDA. All of those things can help try to mitigate some of the, the uneasiness of sharing that sensitive financial data. You know, some of the, to, to ease like the psychological hurdle, you could just simply tell the tenant, hey, you need to think of this landlord like you would think of the banker. They are underwriting a file. They are making a decision. And then yeah. if you wanted to use the banker as the intermediary, that never hurts either because it's probably who they're going to for the money. Yeah, they're loaning you the space just like they would the money. And banks do have the federal requirement. They can't be sharing information. There's no NDA required. It's just right. is what it is. Speaking of banks, um, that's a good segue into the next, the next segment. How's financing going? If you're out there running with a deal right now and someone is in the midst of trying to get financed, how likely is that that they're going to be able to adhere to normal timelines? I, I mean, these are softball questions. I know the answer to that. <laughs> Yeah, things are definitely moving slower, and uh, I think it's just a com the combination of people applying for the CARES loans and the PPP. And the PPP loans, yeah. Someone coming in just to get a normal business loan seems to, it's taking maybe 30 days longer. I, I don't know what the exact time frames are. We had one that was in the midst. It started right at the beginning of March. Closed Friday, but it was about a week to 10 days late. Uh, and that was basically because while they were supposedly working on that SBA loan, uh, that's when the PPP loans came out. And so right. the banker was there, you know, 18 hours a day working on, you know, 12, 12 to 15 different loans a, a day on trying to get those things approved. So it takes a little bit extra time. And also, in my experience, we're not seeing the rock bottom rates. There is no incentive right now for bankers to dive down and give you know, two and a half, three percent rates. And you just aren't seeing it, especially regional and local banks. Yes. <laughs> well, they don't have any incentive to do so. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. you don't know what the, what the future looks like. And, and, and speaking of that, to touch back on the landlord thing, I mean, what, mid-March is when, I want to say it was mid-March when Stitt shut down the state. It was like right in the middle of March. Right. And right out the gate, you saw several banks. We know of a couple of them that said, hey, you know, we'll give you, we're going to cut you a 90-day break. We're doing interest only for 90 days. Uh, so landlords that I've spoken to and read about said, you know what, for 90 days, we're going to cut rents to 50% just to help us get through that. Well, we're almost, I mean, halfway through June would be the 90-day mark. So seeing how June plays out and how July, August, September, uh, especially when business and towards Christmas, things start slowing down, it'll be interesting what happens, who survives, what becomes available if there's free real estate, or not free real estate, but obviously less expensive real estate on the market. Right. Selling. So in that regard, we're still kind of in that window. People have been furloughed, people have been sent home, slowly integrating back. I think companies that have reached out and taken the PPP loans are now obligated to rehire those folks, right? And so there will be a period of time where they, they do get rehired or they don't get reimbursed for, or, or forgiven. Uh, or the loan has been forgiven. Do you see any indication of what is common thought, meaning that people would take less office space? Is it too early to tell? I think I, it's a little early. I'm sorry, Drew. Uh, no, 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 go tell. ahead. Any articles that I'm reading on a more national level, uh, it sounds like that people like the flexibility again of, of being able to work from home and, and that that may come to be a, a, a part of an office life, <laughs> so to speak, right. where maybe they come in three days a week and work from home two days a week. And it sounds like people, I mean, I know that I've missed the collaboration and the interaction with my coworkers. So I think everyone- I think that's a big thing. I think the collaboration is a, is a huge transfer of information. I mean, when we work in the office together, it's me yelling across the hall or vice versa. Hey, you know, I got somebody for that deal. Uh, or hey, call so and so because I know that they would be interested. There's a huge spur of the moment thing, and and now it just there's nothing jogging your memory or the ideas. I kind of think that that is something that's lost out on. So there may be a sway to work at home, but I think it, it sways back. It was interesting that we've all seen it. The articles and the conversations that go both ways. Either office space is going to get smaller because of, you know more, more people are working from home or rotating in and out or right. that it's going to get bigger because they more, need more space uh something interesting i was was reading i can't remember it was an article or a conversation in a podcast it was one or the other but <clears throat> but it was that neither 
neither of those things is going to happen. And that tech, it was a technology article that just temperature scanning software becomes, so you, you walk into a building and if they scan you for guns normally or metal, they just scan your temperature. So as everybody walks into the big office building that's 30 stories high and they're all going their own different ways, as you walk into the building, everybody's temperature is getting scanned. And if you beep, you go off to the left, you have to go home. And it was just as simple as that. Everything stays the same. And then temperature scanning technology gets implemented in every building. Every building. That's interesting because that's not just with COVID. That's with the flu and, and that's how the, you know, the flu spreads around. And so maybe that's a, a way to prevent a lot of communicable virus airborne illnesses. Maybe that's a good thing, right? Everybody, yeah. you're only, only healthy people in the office and yeah. combine that with some HEPA filters and we'll, we're going to be fancy. Back in the game, baby. <laughs> right. um, that's a property management thing. So still on, on a nationwide level, uh, have you seen build, building owners implementing new either temperature scanners? I'm not seeing any yet. Uh, certainly a plethora of hand sanitizing stations. I've seen them everywhere. Uh, at the brewery, at the elevator, uh, all sorts of stuff. Have you seen anything unique? To the point of temperature scanning, yeah. Uh, it was It's a state law. I went to go get my hair cut, obviously, a little bit too long ago, but it was the first one I'd had in a month or two. Uh, and they're required by state law to scan you when you walk in the door. And as soon yep. as you walk in the door, you have to go wash your hands. Yeah, you know, you've had a haircut since then, it's obvious. But it's odd that that's a state-mandated law, that you have to get your temperature scanned when you walk in the door to get your haircut. Right, I could right. see that happening in other industries. Yeah, happened to me. Uh, it was a manual deal, and, and now they have the kind that – they, they're touchless, right? You can just walk up to somebody and, and do that. So interesting. I think that there's going to be um, more visibility of cleaning people during the day, you know, day porters, things like that in an office building that normally you don't see until the nighttime. But now it, it's going to be more of a positive, something where people see those uh, cleaning crew walking around, wiping things down. I was reading um, something about touchless commands for the elevators so you don't have to push the buttons and right. things like that that could uh come into play um i haven't seen that yet here but right uh, just an evolution of what will happen with you know getting people in and out and making things a little less fingerprints all over everything so probably a, an increased common area charge or, or uh, a, a maintenance charge uh, if you're in an office building so you're your triple nets or your, your cam expenses go up a little bit. Uh, your property management prices go up because now you have a little more staff. You have a lot of more uh, necessary supplies to stock. So it becomes a little bit more expensive. Either the tenants absorb that or the landlord absorbs that. That's yet to be seen. Um, and I would guess if you're competing for tenants now and you're competing for space, that's going to be another cost that's going to be the burden of, of the landlord. Depends what market you're in. If you have a, you know, a, a 90 eight to a hundred percent occupied market. And then, you know, the landlord has the favor, but if you're like Tulsa, who is oil and gas historically centered, which has been really decimated in the last oh, 60 to 90 days, uh, we have a little bit of hole in the, in the market for office space. And so I think that's going to be something that the landlord has to pick up and, and uh, absorb in my opinion, any unicorns out there in regards to tenants, is there anybody that's making it? I think medical staying busy for sure. Um, it's uh, their their business hasn't slowed down, and it, there may be a little bit of more time for them to kind of focus on the needs for space versus um, the way it was before. You know, they, they right. were, were focusing on trying to accommodate more people into their facilities, the medical on the medical side. Right. We talked about oil and gas. Uh, construction uh, things are still being built I would imagine there's still going to be a slowdown though uh, you know the projects have probably slowed down uh, everybody in that construction world architects um, in the medical field I you know elective surgeries those were ground to a halt we met with a, a group of orthopedists over the break or I guess the break during COVID um, they were out of work they were shut down completely and so uh, they came to tour a building and just sat and talked I mean, they had nobody else to talk to. So they were just happy to, to be out and talk about real estate and what's going on and ended up turning into cars and the lack of sports and all sorts of stuff. It was interesting. So medical uh, depends what kind, 
right? So, so clinics and, and general health, I would say, is probably still very busy. Uh, if you're manufacturing any, you know, glycerin, alcohol, sanitizers, alcohol, beer, even craft breweries took a hit because no one's going to restaurants and ordering stuff. So if, if you're a direct to consumer, I think that's something to think about. Is there anybody else that you're thinking of that has done well or, or survived better than others? I think an uh, industry that we don't really talk about a lot is medical cannabis. Um, in the state of Oklahoma, it is legal. Um, yeah. It's hard. And so as a real estate industry, it has just completely changed our dynamic. I think the public kind of forget how many, not only dispensaries, but manufacturers, growing operations, there's so much on the back end. And all of those operations were going full steam ahead during the pandemic. And so just like a liquor store, they were deemed an essential business and have been super popular during this time. Um, but that's been an industry in our state that's new, um, newer, and has been extremely successful. Right. Yeah. It was in the paper. I believe it was April. They had the, the most record-setting month in the history of the industry in the state. So that falls in line with alcohol, right? The, 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 the old saying that alcohol is depression-proof because people are going to drink it when they're happy and they're going to drink it when they're sad. Uh, I guess you know, same goes for... All right. So um, local economy, we talked a little bit about oil and gas. We talked about weed. We're in Tulsa in phase three now, I think is correct. And it's June 1st. And phase three, I think is, that's green flag racing, I think, right? And it's up to the business's decision whether or not that they uh, are, are back to normal or not. Uh, not the case around the country. You know, if you have friends in other areas, they're, you know, still still locked down in some cases. California out west is, is certainly close. Uh, we talked about, you mentioned Branson, uh, was just in, in Branson and it was still uh, fairly sheltered there. Right, yeah. It was interesting to just see the the strip or lack of activity going on there. I just wasn't aware that they were still in phase one. So it's kind of a shock to go and see it so dead, which is normally a very busy time of year once it starts to warm up there, so. Right. Um, Neil? And an asset class that we haven't talked about yet that it's funny, it, of course, this makes sense to me just because of where I am in life, but uh, child care. Yeah. Daycare centers, all that kind of stuff. Summer school specifically. There's been a lot of conversation, not just in my household, but between other peers of mine and Neil, obviously you got young kids uh, that, that like right now, I mean, summer school is a big chunk of income for the churches that provide schools, for daycare centers, I mean, you you know that. And there's a big if as to whether kids are gonna attend summer school this year or not. Mm -hmm. um, the school where my kids go, uh, camps and everything have been canceled through June. I think they're gonna tentatively have yet to cancel any activities for July, but it's probably wait and see. I mean, we're a month away, we'll see how everything goes. With the, the national the national coverage of the Floyd George uh, situation, the COVID talk has gone down tremendously. Almost, I mean, you're seeing in social media it was kind of almost as as a joke, right? Like so, so that the virus is dead now, right? Because we've moved we've moved on, uh, and everybody's over it. And so, I wonder if this accelerates everybody's uh, return to work or return into uh, society. Or it accelerates COVID. Or, or that comes back. You, I mean, it's such an interesting time to, to kind of figure this out. I mean, there's certainly a, 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 an important stance to stay away from the virus and, and maintain and the safety of everybody, but getting everybody back to work at, at what point is a socially acceptable level of risk? I don't know what that is. You know, um, certainly we, we've learned that we've lived with risk every day coming to the office. Um, the, the flu and driving your car and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, I think it's interesting as the numbers go down, how fast people reintegrate because it's been a mental change for sure. And how does that translate to, to office space? I mean, that's crystal ball questions, yeah. but I think, I think if you have a long time horizon, you value the uh, collaboration that we talked about. I think you value the, the human tendency um, that, everything will get back to normal. We have a long enough you know, track record to look at what people do after situations like this. 
So I think if you if you're looking in the long run, everything does fall back into place. Are there some measures that then come about? Some new technology like you know scanning people's foreheads and microchip <laughs> vaccines. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but I I think everything gets back to normal. I mean we like you said, you guys have closed on some properties. Uh, we're still showing space, and let's get into that. What do tours and, and showings look like right now? I just had a tour. Um, we are representing uh, the sub-landlord, and they were bringing a possible tenant through, and the tenant was looking upwards to 14,000 square feet. So you still have these big companies still looking for space, and it was yeah. simple as I came early, wiped everything down, passed out the flyers on the table, and then just let them kind of walk around themselves. We all had masks on, and like you said, Germex was our friend, the beginning and the end. So there are still deals being done. You just tap in elbows instead of shaking hands, if at all. And that seems to be, the nice thing is we are all going through this together. And so when you show up to a tour, you know, we're all trying to be preventative together, um, which is kind of a nice twist on an unfortunate event. There has been a collective kind of bringing everybody together as they're almost kind of a campy type feel. <laughs> hey, good to see you, elbow bump or fist bump or whatever, and then immediately spray off and wash your hands. But everybody seems to be pretty collaborative, which is which is a, something that we haven't seen in a long time. Sometimes they, they walk right in and immediately it's in a positioning mode. Mm -hmm. so, so good. All right, so we've talked national economy, we've talked locally. We have some of the, uh, the questions that we get as as brokers, what are we seeing in the marketplace? When do we come back? Crystal ball question. I think if we had to put a hard date on it. I think that you probably reach an 80% back to work within the next two weeks. Here we are, June, June 15th. June 15th seems to be a date that was named, you know, a month or two ago. Uh, I got to think, you know, that that kind of holds to or, or has some sort of bearing on people coming back in. My prediction um, is is mid June. Square footages go up or down. I, I kind of agree with. With Drew, I mean, you know, we had a, a very prominent landlord that we spoke with before the the last uh, recorded call. At I said, hey, you know, and went right into it. I I took the side of, of the general rumors and said, everybody thinks that everybody's going to be leasing less space and all the businesses are going to work from home and there's going to be no need for big office buildings. He goes, we leased 100,000 square feet in the last. I think at the time was 45 days and both tenants took more square footage than they originally intended because they did away with a bullpen environment. So the six feet of separation got bigger. Um, the amount of per square feet per person got bigger, more hard walled offices. It did cost him more in TIs, but they leased more space and a longer term. So worked a deal that, that did well there. I've already seen in my feed from some vendors, if you have a bullpen environment, they're selling the dividers that are going up and creating separation from people. Any any inventions that you've seen fed to you in the last 60 days that helped that? I think there's going to be a trend towards um, little smaller areas to work off your laptop within the office, possibly. Uh, maybe the, small, you know, the large conference rooms where 30 people can go in probably won't be in the plans uh, right. as much anymore because you know, I think people want to keep the distance. So maybe, maybe just amenities uh, in a building where people can go sit outside or, or a smaller conference room within the space where two or three people can sit at social distances uh, might be a, yeah. and uh, maybe higher uh, internet speeds, things like that. So people yeah. can do teleconferencing, uh, Zoom meetings, or other platforms they have to, to meet electronically or digitally. Yeah, I've noticed that at our house. I don't know how many devices we have going on in our house. TVs, phones, Nintendo Switch, and Xbox, a you know, couple computers. Yeah, <clears throat> it's crazy. I think you'll still have a digital component to meetings. I think people for a considerable amount of time will want to have the option to be able to call in or sit on a computer at their house and Zoom into calls. I think that's a dynamic we'll see continue even when people go back to the office, still having that option. But I have steward clients that are wanting an office and having the capacity to social distance is their number one priority. And that's brand new. We hadn't heard that before. We were going to the more open concept offices and now hard walls are 
coming back into style. <laughs> They're making their circle back around. Um, and I think we'll see that for a considerable future, at least through 2020. Yep, I, I would agree. I, I use the example of, do you remember when gym memberships uh, were, it was a huge, like Ballyhoo Fitness was the big thing in probably the 80s. And then there was a surge to go very small, one-on-one -on -one individual boutique gyms. And then you had kind of the resurgence back in, Gold's Gym came back out, then you had Planet Fitness come back out, then you had um, Lifetime Fitness is, is now, it's way bigger than, than Valley used to be. Uh, so I wonder, in office space where we have all the way down to the WeWork environment with no walls, everybody sits out in the open to very quickly, I need more separation. So those are either dividers or hard walled offices. So swinging back and forth. That's a very you know, quick trend. And it depends on the type of business, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we've talked about the national economy, local economy, tours and marketing, social media. This is, this is a prime example of doing a Zoom meeting and, and broadcasting that. I mentioned before that we've made some Amazon purchases over this last 60 days and we've got some uh, some some cameras and video equipment that didn't have earlier. So do you see the rise of video tours being more prominent? Maybe on the front end, but I just feel like, and I've always felt like this, that you can't experience a property. I mean, you can't smell a video tour. I mean, you can't see what the neighbors are look like. You can't walk in there. It's, it's really hard. It's such a, like a six cent or like, it's like a full sensory experience to go to a property and you can't get that in a two dimensional world. I, I look at, our sister company, which is the residential side here at McGraw Realtors, almost every listing has got some sort of video tour and aerials and, and tour. I'm not going to go take a look at a property unless I've already perused yeah. it. That'll get them in it. Yeah. The pictures and the video tour get your attention to get you to go there. Yeah. I don't think we lease space off of just the video tour or sell space for that matter. Well, and I'm seeing uh, requests for the floor plans with measurements a lot more now yeah, so can see right. what the layout really is versus just a, just a plain floor plan. So, you know, if it's a national tenant that doesn't want to come tour till they know for sure, they want to, they want to drill down into the size of the spaces, the size of the offices, you know, everything that's there before they get out. The part is that becomes expensive. I mean, to market the property or for the seller of the property. I mean, I wouldn't hurt if you own a property for 10 or 15 years that you have the floor plan. Most of them don't. I could see that being something that people need to have handy. Yeah. And knowing the resources to call if you need one of those. So there are space planners out there and we certainly work with architectural groups. This will be a, a shameless plug, but if anybody is watching this and they say, you know what, I probably need to get my property measured. Who do I call? Let us know. Um, each one of us on here knows a contact that we can reach out to at either an architectural firm or they do it themselves. Um, lastly, I think Tour Factory, which is a company that the residential side uses quite a bit, uses a, the Matterport camera, which I think has that space lasering technology yeah. to, to be able to kick that out as well. The least expensive and probably most, uh, 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 I'd say, it, subjectively effective way and, and, and right way is just to call an appraiser An appraisal will probably do a floor plan space for a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. So a couple different options. You can do the architectural route you can do a, a, a laser image or, or, you know, work with the appraiser. Certainly look online. Uh, you can find uh, some measurements that the assessor has probably already done uh, on the space. So that's, that's a, a free uh, capability in that regard. So, Okay. Well, uh, I think we've taken up a lot of time. We briefly covered each one of these things. If anybody out here is having some questions about something we didn't cover, anything that they would like to know more information about, Hannah, Lisa, Drew, myself, please reach out to us. The phone number is 918-388-9588. It's the main line. You'll get to talk to Nadia. Uh, send us an email. Uh, I think it's info at mcgrawcp.com, uh, or you can, uh, you know, Call us directly and, and we can get that to you. Uh, www.mcgrawcp.com. That's M C G R A W C P.com. You can check out some of our existing listings and profiles and, and uh, certainly links for contact information there. So, all right, everybody, thank you very, very much for your time. We'll get this uh, uh, blasted out and uh, maybe uh, generate some questions from some folks and hopefully do them a service. So, I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.